<laughs> no, we, we welcome you and we thank you so much for accepting our invitation to our colloquium. And let you let's, let me just introduce you to the participants in this colloquium, and that will be also in English. <laughs> well, welcome everyone to this colloquium. Our speaker today is Daniel Goldman. Daniel Goldman is a professor in the School of Physics at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where he holds a Don family professorship. Professor Goldman's research program investigates the interaction of biological and physical systems with complex materials like granular media. He receives his PhD in 2002 from the University of Texas at Austin, studying nonlinear dynamics and granular media. He later on did a postdoctoral work in locomotion biomechanics at the University of California at Berkeley. And then in 2007, he became a faculty member at Georgia Tech. Professor Goldman's, Goldman is an Ocean member of the School of Biology and a member of the Bioengineering Graduate Program. Professor Goldman is a Georgia Power Professor of Excellence, a Fellow of the American Physical Society, and he has many awards to be numbered here. But uh, just to finish with this presentation, uh, his work, I want to mention that his work has also been featured by the New York Times, BBS, Discovery Channel, and National Geographic and other media sources. <laughs> we welcome you, Daniel, to our colloquium, and the time is yours. Ah, muchas gracias. Uh, I wish, as I was telling Ricardo, I wish I could give the talk in Spanish, but as many as much as I've tried over the years to learn to speak Spanish, even living in in Madrid for a summer, uh, I am so terrible. So I'll be the dumb American and speak in in English solamente. Uh, okay. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation. I'm rather sad that I'm not physically in Morelia uh, today, but maybe one day, if you like my talk, you'll have me back, and I'd be delighted to, to, to visit. Um, let me just make sure I can see people. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about some work we've been doing. I don't know, it really intellectually got started, I'd say about probably 10 years ago. Um, <clears throat> um, but descends, in fact, from my background, oops, from my background in nonlinear dynamics, my, my interest in living systems uh, and the realization that robots uh, are pretty interesting and cool and can be put to good use in physics. Um, now, I call this field robophysics, and uh, we have some reviews, and you can look at our website, which I'll list later. Um, robotics meets physics. And I should say that the word robot is, is, comes from uh, this play by Karol Kapek uh, from a Czech word, roboty, which means forced labor. And this is a funny play from 1920, Russum's Universal Robots, in which they make robots that kind of look like humans. And then the humans are, uh, the, the robots rise up and, and overthrow. And anyway, there's a, a Project Gutenberg has the copy of it. And you can amuse yourself by reading this uh, from, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, okay. Um, so that's, I, that's, the old uh, version of robots. And here is what a physicist does with a robot. We indeed uh, make them uh, force labor, uh, but in this case, forcing a limbless robot through an array. And hopefully you'll see why on earth I, we're doing that as we move along. Okay, so it's interesting that the discipline of robotics has largely involved electrical and mechanical engineering, computer science in the mid, since the mid 20th century. Very few physicists have uh, kind of engaged in this sort of multidisciplinary uh, activity, and that may be for the good or the bad. I tend to think that there's plenty of opportunity. Um, but indeed, these engineers and computer scientists and others have made great progress. Um, and so, you know, as you probably know, robots basically build our cars, and virtual robots uh, basically defeat us in all of our uh, games. Um, and I want to make a point that they essentially, robots function well in environments that are relatively controlled 
or virtual. Um, we'll amplify on that. Uh, we're beginning to have robots that sort of start to move into environments uh, that are, are uh, more like the environments that present us with uh, interesting locomotion challenges. And these are robots that are uh, running around on hard ground. These are robots that may one day be delivering our packages via Amazon. They are robots that may be driving our cars. And they're even robots that may be swimming around uh, underwater. Um, where robots don't function well, uh, so well yet, uh, are in more complicated environments, like those that might be found in extraterrestrial uh, situations, those uh, near my office and in midtown Atlanta, like these paved roads, uh, disaster uh, sites and building rubble, forest floor, desert environment, leaf litter, snow, uh, grassy fields. Uh, we don't yet have robots that can uh, effectively move in such environments. Um, and I should say that this is a problem for many reasons, and I think this is an example which always sort of strikes me, that you might remember this disaster from uh, Thailand a few years back uh, when these boys who were ultimately uh, recovered were a soccer team, were caught, uh, found themselves lost in this cage, a cave. Um, and in fact, it was a huge amount of human labor to try to rescue these kids. Um, and you might say, where were the robots? And the answer is we just didn't have robots that could, could navigate in these complex hydrodynamic, aerodynamic, uh, terrestrial situations to squeeze through uh, tunnels, to, to climb walls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I can show you some of these, oops, uh, why isn't playing? I could show you some examples of these, which are fun to look at, um, in which watching robots kind of is a blooper reel of watching robots try to move around in complex environments. Uh, these, for example, is a well-known wheel of the Opportunity rover on Mars, in which it basically kind of, its wheel moved through sort of a creme brulee type uh, environment, loose material under kind of a, a rigid but breakable surface and then got stuck for about a month. This is a time lapse of a month. Here's a robot which is a relative of that uh, rapidly running robot you saw on the first slide. It's called R-Hex, and it's trying to climb a, a hill in the desert southwest of the US, and it's failing because of mismanagement of, of its interaction with the environment. Uh, and here is a robot which is from my uh, collaborator, from a collaborator at Carnegie Mellon, how he chose it. And this is a robot which is called a mod snake, and it's supposed to be a limbless robot, and it's supposed to scoot around through uh, kind of grassy, complex environments. Could be a robot to, to explore the caves that I mentioned, um, and doesn't do particularly well in this situation. Okay, well, we, we sort of ask then, <clears throat> what are, from the engineering point of view, what are appropriate control principles and models of locomotors in complex environments? How much feedback is needed for robots to kind of sense something about their environment and execute the appropriate movement? Uh, how much is can be built into the mechanics of the situation? And how much do we need to understand, I'll just give a plug for this, what we call now pterodynamic interactions to make uh, an analogy with aerodynamic and hydrodynamic interactions, which are reasonably well understood and thus allow us to build airplanes and, and submarines, um, we don't have yet the, I, the same kind of level of understanding of so-called pterodynamic interactions, the limbs with complex ground and feet, bodies with grass, uh, wheels with granular material that we do in the air and fluid situation. Um, in fact, let me just show you that because this will really, I think, point out the disparity uh, in how what we understand uh, and, and, and how to engineer robots that can move around in complex environments and what uh, exists in the natural world. It's a video I love to show, and some of you might have seen this before. There's a little lizard, um, and you can barely see a little snake behind it. Hopefully, you'll be able to see the video. Um, this is from a BBC show, and I'll play it, and you'll see the lizard being uh, suddenly chased by not one, too, but I'm merely thinking, boy, there really needs, we think that physics has a real role uh, to play in here. Um, so 
you know, studying the emergent aspects of robot and animal locomotion has been and remains a challenge. Robots have been expensive, hard to make flexible, hard to add sensors, et cetera, et cetera. Animals, like you saw in the previous video, uh, if we want to understand locomotion again, are often uncooperative, hard to control, and sort of too good. And I think this is a cool point because, you know, when I first started and got into this business, when I was a postdoc studying locomotion about 20 years ago, I naively, you know, I had studied, uh, I had studied classical mechanics, and so I thought I understood what locomotion is or movement is. Movement is basically what Galileo and Newton taught us that in the absence of uh, forces, you go from A to B with, with uh, no problem. But of course, uh, organisms have to generate internal forces which uh, interact with the environments to propel themselves. Uh, and and so while it looks trivial to go from A to B. The amount of complexity and beauty uh, underneath the hood, uh, and even what you can see, is is immense. Uh, and further, the organisms do it so well that you might even think it's sort of a non-problem. And you only realize it's a problem when you actually try to model it or build a robot that can do similar. Uh, and sadly, in animals, still, we have very limited capabilities to record muscle and neural activity, 3D kinematics and dynamics in natural environments. Um, however, in contrast, oops. That, oh no. Yikes. That's weird. Hang on. Let me just. Uh, oh, okay. I don't know why it wasn't playing. I apologize. In contrast, um, it's now increasingly easy to make low cost, and I'll call them robo-physical models, to test and generate control hypotheses, let's say for biology, compare experiment and theory into very parameters to discover new dynamics. And I like this video in particular. Here's one of the early reviews we wrote on this. There's a couple more in the pipeline. Um, what I like about this video is that, in fact, it was generated uh, by a former postdoc in my lab, Henry Astley, who's now a professor in, in Akron. He was a biologist who was interested in studying snake locomotion and came to my lab to learn to build robots. Even though I'm not a roboticist, I'm a physicist. But what he realized and what we had realized is that with the increasing power and decreasing cost, cost of things like these Dynamixel servo motors and controller boards and 3D printing, which allows you to sort of create uh, arbitrary bodies and shapes, one can basically cook up robots uh, to one's heart's desire um, and, uh, and, and develop these things and really uh, begin to experimentally test and manipulate parameters in the way I, as an experimental physicist, like to do. So here he was interested in studying how this undulatory robot, which is connected by a series, and this will come up over and over in the talk, a series of motors, which uh, each motor is connected to the next, and you play a certain command to the motor to tell it how to change its angle as a function of time. And if you can generate certain waves, it can move effectively on the surface of granular material. Uh, and of course, from the kind of point of view of understanding the organism, I sort of subscribe to a kind of bastardized version of Feynman's quote, well, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And this becomes very clear trying to understand principles of living system movement um, uh, when uh, trying to build these things and make models. Okay, so this has been sort of our, our charge here. The goal of locomotion, in this case, I'll talk about robophysics, is systematic discovery and search for principles of successful and failed movement of self-propelling systems that, at natural environments. And one of the things that we as physicists do is bring to this, my engineering colleagues tend to focus on the successes. Um, largely, the robots function as demonstrations of control principles, because that's the intellectual background of their of their field. Uh, but we in physics find that you know, we don't particularly care if the robot does well moving through a pipe or, or climbing. A, it, we're interested in the principles, typically. Uh, and so the failures, why this robot doesn't move, why it's certain wiggle patterns don't move, why it pushes the ground out of the way are as interesting as not. So it's really putting the experiment at the fore, in my opinion. Um, and in fact, now, when I started this, there was no such thing as active matter, but now we can sort of call these examples of active matter, which is very hot in condensed matter physics or in aspects of condensed matter physics. And this is really putting the active into active matter, if I can be funny. 
uh, most active matter systems are relatively simple in, in, in how the individual agents uh, generate activity. Uh, and here we can actually begin to have more complex agents and actually discover principles. Okay, I also want to put a plug in that this is, uh, I see this robophysics is a kind of interesting complementary physical modeling approach, traditional physics modeling approaches. We essentially simplify systems to the essence and use analytic theory, digital computation, a model that's been the paradigm in, of course, in, in, in physics and biology um, and most sciences, but I see that this sort of physical modeling where the robo being the active part is a nice uh, uh, counterpart. And in fact, um, this fits in uh, as well because my kind of main core intellectual interest, and for those of you who are interested in biological physics, what we now call physics of living systems or robophysics or as another aspect might be interested to come to Georgia Tech where we actually have expertise in our department across uh, biological length and time scales. And in fact, this is now becoming uh, uh, recognized as a, a proper subfield of physics such that we, I'm on a committee uh, sponsored by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences to write the first decadal survey. Uh, these are surveys which other branches of physics, other subfields of physics generate every 10 years to kind of review the state of the field and see what's next. We're writing the first decadal review survey on biological physics slash the physics living systems. It should be out in the next year or so. Um, and I think that robophysics forms an important and maybe even critical uh, modeling component for living systems across scales. Okay. And I'm even trying to push a new term, living systems physicist, not unlike a soft condenser of condensed matter physicist, astrophysicist, plasma physicist, particle physicist, nuclear physicist. Why not a living systems physicist? Okay. Okay. As well as the, the we can, okay, I'll ignore that. Uh, so as I mentioned, <clears throat> before I get on with the, the meat of the talk here, you know, since we started, we came across 3D printers, I don't know, 10 years ago, and these motors and controllers became so readily available. Uh, it's just become, and the fact that I'm at Georgia Tech, which we get an enormous number of brilliant undergraduates and graduate students who want to build robots and built them in their high schools. Uh, and the fact that, like I said, the decreasing cost uh, means that these things have basically become an infestation in my lab. And they often get names like a sandfish robot or a biped robot, or I'll talk about the fracked bot today. Uh, but they can be collective, lo oops, collective locomotors. Uh, they can be made of soft materials. They can be ensembles. And I'm not going to talk about all these today. You're welcome to go to our website uh, at grablab.gotech.edu to take a look. Uh, at all the fun we've been having. Okay, the talk today is basically going to concern this robot, which I'll call the frack bot for no good reason. It's just that people like to uh, name their robots. Uh, and here will be my example in robophysics, an attempt to develop a framework to understand movement in complex environments or pterodynamic interactions in active systems. And here are the folks who've done the work. Uh, uh, Jennifer Reeser was a postdoc and is now a faculty member at Emory, who you might enjoy hearing from. Um, and uh, Perry Schiebel uh, led the other main project that I'll talk about today. She's now a postdoc with Rob Woodard Harvard. But here you can imagine that I have a robot that I send to a uh, Martian terrain, and I want it to actually move rapidly from place to place, not to spend months traversing a small patch. And so the question is, how can I think of what kind of framework can I develop to understand how these legged or limbless robots move around? Okay. Well, it turns out that, that one problem with just throwing a robot into an environment like this, which is what folks tend to do, although obviously you can't do that extraterrestrially, is that these are too complex, at least too complex for the physicist in me. So when we first started this, we said, well, we should go to the laboratory. We can make like a Martian landscape in the laboratory and it could have some loose grains and some bigger boulders and we could watch how a little robot that we can control and create and move around effectively in such an environment. And it turned out that was also still too complex. It was just so much dynamics. And so, so we decided to downscope and we had the idea again, because of my physics background, uh, that we should think of the 
Martian landscape or the desert landscape is basically a scattering of problem. And it could be then a statistical approach. So I have a robot here, a simulation in this case, of a robot moving in a boulder field, a regular array of boulders, and it collides with those boulders and can be reoriented. Uh, sorry for the quality of the video, but this shows you a little bit better. Um, and so here's the robot and it's colliding and being reoriented and colliding being reoriented <clears throat> and it doesn't know at this point about anything that's any interactions that are going on it's just sort of statistically scattering and then one might say well if i let this robot loose in mars where would it be after a day a year whatever that was the idea and so then the hypothesis would be if i could understand the single boulder scattering scattering if i'm in a limit where boulders are far enough apart I can predict long-term dynamics without having to compute detailed collision interactions. It would be sort of a statistical mechanics of locomotion on complex terrain. Again, in inspiration with the early work of uh, Lorentz, who had motion of electron and metallic bodies, which spawned lots of uh, mathematics, of course, um, for analyzing scattering in, in, in different lattices. Okay, this would be the active version of these sorts of things. Okay, well, uh, even that was too complicated. So what we de decided to do was downscope <clears throat> and do it experimentally and basically study the robot, a single robot scattering off a single boulder uh, and, and see what kind of dynamics we could learn. It was just a, an experiment. We didn't know if it would be interesting or not. Um, but this was the work of Fei Fei Chen. And we developed a system because in robotics, folks tend to, as I said, treat the, treat the devices as kind of uh, demonstration of the control principle. Here we wanted to do what we like to do in, 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 in physics and do repeated systematic tests, varying parameters uh, in the experimental system. And we wanted to understand then the motion of a single robot with a single boulder. So we created a system which we call Scatter, which basically is a jamming gripper, which picks up a boulder and picks up a robot. And you'll see in a minute and fluidizes the sand, the granular material, so that it resets the state of the material, puts the boulder down, the robot runs, and it finds the robot with like a vision system, picks it up, puts it back, et cetera, et cetera. And does it over and over and over. So Fei-Fei, once she developed this, could just push a button and her thesis was basically, uh, at least experimentally, done for her. Okay, and we found some interesting things. So here is how a robot interacts with a single boulder. And, um, to our surprise, often the interactions were not necessarily just being <clears throat> repelled away from a boulder. Uh, this is a little uh, sphere that is relatively lightweight. But on occasion, the robot looked like it would be sort of attracted to the boulder. And of course, microscopically, meaning it's limb interaction, this is not, you know, you can sort of understand it in principle. The limb on this side uh, is uh, generating forces in the ground. The limb on this side is slipping more, so you end up with a torque which rotates it. Uh, but the cool thing was that that as I varied the impact, as we varied the impact parameter of the boulder, of the robot against the boulder, sometimes it was indeed attracted to the boulder, and sometimes it was repelled. Okay, uh, and it turned out that it was kind of cool that we discovered some generality that the attractive and repulsion interaction pattern was insensitive to boulder properties, shape and texture, um, and these are our physicist versions of boulders. <clears throat> Here are some three D printed objects. And it turned out it was largely dominated by which face the robot's limb collided with. So if it hit close to the front uh, in its reference frame of the boulder, it tended to be, I think, uh, attracted. And on the uh, rear lead trailing edge, it tended to be repelled or maybe vice versa. But this gave us kind of an interesting you know, idea on how to control uh, robot dynamics such that instead of the paradigm had been sort of that I carefully approach an obstacle and put my foot down and, and make sure I plan for that interaction. Uh, here, what you do is you sort of know where your foot is hitting on the boulder. And uh, you know, based on the scattering pattern, where you're going to scatter, whether you're going to be attracted or repelled. And what you do is that then you take a tail uh, and you put that tail into the ground, and that tail, you generate a counter torque to keep you going straight, depending on whether you've hit on the front or the back of the boulder. And this is called anticipatory uh, control, and it allows you to pre-correct for the scatter. Okay, we thought that was kind of cool, because then you don't have to, uh, 
if you're trying to control your system, the, the, the disturbance doesn't get too strongly into the, into the system. We did some more interesting things. Uh, we, we, in addition to studying the sphere, <clears throat> and these are impact parameters only on this side of Boulder, we studied half cylinders, and we found that, indeed, you could have repulsion and attraction from a sphere. Um, a half cylinder uh, had basically repulsion or attraction. And the interesting thing was that if I had a full cylinder, uh, I ended up with a blank spot in my scattering distribution post-collision. Basically, the robot would collide, and the common uh, dynamics would either lead it to scatter off to the right or scatter off to the left, but never in between. Okay. Well, I had a realization. I was doing, we were doing this stuff, and I was teaching classical mechanics one, <clears throat> and I was telling my students all about collisions. Um, and, and when I tell my students all about collisions, I'll quote Landau and Lifshitz here, in many cases, the laws of conservation of momentum and energy alone can be used to obtain important results concerning the properties of various mechanical processes. It should be noted these properties are independent of the particular type of interaction between the particles involved. And it turns out that in our active or self-propelled or robotic collisions, we have neither energy nor momentum conservation. That's what makes them active. And so I said, well, let's call what we're studying active collisions. <clears throat> now, uh, we are not the first to study active collisions, of course. Uh, in addition to roboticists, physicists have, uh, and others have, have uh, played these games. Uh, and you find rather fascinating dynamics, and I just list some, uh, some examples here. Here's one from a former student of mine's work where he studied a cockroach and cockroach robot moving through a cluttered landscape and found kind of interesting aspects to how the robot would roll and pitch in response and, and ultimately emergently uh, make it through these complex terrain with no sensory feedback. Um, here is, oops. Here is Ray Goldstein's work of scattering of <clears throat> little clammy chlamydomonas algae uh, from surfaces. And there's an interesting and beautiful interaction of their flagellar beating with the surface. And here's one of my favorite examples, in fact, motivated much of this work that I'm telling you about, is the famous uh, work of Couder and Fort and then Bohr, Anderson, Latrop, and, and John Bush um, on studying a little millimetric droplet, which is uh, bouncing on a vibrating fluid surface, generating a wave field, and then interacting with that wave field. And if you put obstacles in the way, uh, you get rather beautiful and complicated scattering dynamics. Okay. Well, <clears throat> because of our interest in snakes and, and limbless systems, and uh, I said, well, you know, we should probably try to study active collisions in limbless locomotives. Um, and here's one of our robots. I said, as I said, it's, we call it the Frackbot for this purpose. Um, it's a robot that is, again, all relatively cheap, easy to make, um, you know, if you're a good experimentalist, uh, made of 3D printed parts. You have motors here, motor, 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 motor 12 motors or so. Uh, you have markers, which allow us to track the movement of the robot. You have little wheels. These happen to be Lego wheels. They're passive. And they couple the robot's self-deformation pattern. Uh, how I change the angle of the motor is a function of time and motor number. In this case, we apply a uh, control such that each motor is, is oscillating sinusoidally and the motor downstream is phase shifted by a little bit. And that's what generates a so-called serpenoid curve in the words of a famous uh, roboticist, Hirose. Um, if I just didn't have uh, wheels and it's not an environment, that robot would just self-deform and change its shape as a function of time. But when I put on these Lego wheels, that generates a frictional drag and isotropy which allows the robot to basically move uh, straight, undulating with very little slip. So tail segments follow the head, okay? So then the next obvious thing, right, from the business point of view, you don't take it out to Mars or, or to your complicated backyard. You put it in a physicist version of, uh, of an array of, of obstacles. And here was our experiment. Um, you have uh, five posts. You line the robot up in front of the posts, you hit go. The robot controller and motor's job is basically to keep that self-deformation pattern, that serpenoid curve uh, playing. And when it collides with the environment, our first order bit was just to say, well, let's just study the mechanics, the active mechanics. Let's see what happens when it collides. Uh, and so we don't let the robot sense the surroundings. The only control is maintaining the self-deformation pattern. You might say that's a crazy thing to do. 
but I'll come back later and uh, show you that it's maybe not be so crazy. Um, okay, that's the experiment. Here's what it looks like. So there's a box of initial conditions. We can start the robot, which sort of samples different ways it could collide with the post. And you'll see sometimes it collides. This is all emergent, by the way. Sometimes it collides and scatters off to the left, right? Sometimes it collides and goes straight. Sometimes it collides and scatters off to the left, just like that uh, slightly simpler in principle boulder uh, experiment I showed you in a legged locomotive. Okay, that's the experiment. The cool thing, right, is if you do this a couple times, you could see that, like it says, you scatter off to the left and, and, and deterministically scatters off to the right. But we sort of got inspired and said, boy, this kind of looks like it's a wavy thing, which is scattering and, and, and changing orient angle of trajectory. It kind of looks like the fraction. Okay, well, you know, I don't have to tell this audience that the fraction, of course, by waves and regular rays is a seemingly very different phenomenon. <clears throat> And one can, of course, analyze it uh, using uh, whatever wave equations you like. Um, and uh, this is, this is, of course, where a robot is is just a single entity, which is sort of a wave and localized at the same time. And 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 laser light, of course, behaves nothing like that. Uh, and or so we tell our early waves and oscillation students. Um, but the interesting thing, of course, in waves, if I diffract a wave. Uh, through a grading or through something with some space in characteristic D, uh, we see characteristic peaks. And those characteristic peaks have maxima, which occur basically at D times sine of theta, uh, where theta would be down here, uh, which is equal to some uh, function, some multiple of the wavelength, and D is the spacing. Okay? All right. Uh, so, in fact, the smaller the spacing, the further out these peaks are going to be, as we remember from our waves class. Okay. Our system is not like this. <clears throat> our system is really more like, eh, if I want an analogy, more like wave equal diffraction, which is Eddington's term. Uh, and this was, of course, what, what Couder and Fort were, were doing when they were scattering droplets, through which interacted with obstacles in the wave field uh, through, uh, through boundaries. This is, of course, what happens when I uh, send single electrons one at a time uh, through arrays, I can find diffraction because of cool quantum mechanical wave particle effects. Uh, this is, of course, what happens when Taylor first did his feeble light diffraction uh, studies, uh, which is an interesting paper from 1909. He was the first one to show that basically you could get crazy uh, diffraction phenomena without having full waves, just from individual, in principle, photons of light going through one at a time interacting with themselves, scattering, and generating a <clears throat> pattern not unlike we see with the electrons here. So our system, because you're sort of going one at a time and diffracting, kind of has more of a flavor of this. But we said, let's see how much we could push that analogy. Obviously, there's nothing quantum mechanical going on. This is active collisions. So we decided to build up our scattering pattern one trial at a time. And before we had a kind of scatter-like gantry system, which we'd pick up and find the robot, we had poor Perrin, who was an early graduate student, who would basically do that. Uh, and that video you saw in the first uh, a couple slides ago was basically her, <clears throat> the results of her doing that. And here the robot goes and collides and sometimes goes to the left and sometimes goes to the right. Anyway, she did this, she and Jennifer did this over and over and over and over and over to build up our so-called uh, scattering pattern. And here's what we found, which kind of, impressed us. Uh, what I'm going to now show you now is basically the probability to find the robot post-collision. But first, I'm going to show you so-called heat maps, where the color will indicate how often the robot visited that spatial location. And on the left, I'm going to show you where the head, we track the head, went, and on the right, I'm going to show you the average midline, draw a straight line from head to tail. And here's what it looks like. And you'll note that Either you can look at either one. This one, you can actually see where the head is wiggling back and forth as it's going through the post. And here you can see sort of the body. Um, you'll note that the, there's scattering to the left, scattering to the right, and some now scattering through the middle. Uh, and that, as I add number of experiments, gets sharper and sharper, such that if I have 327 trajectories and I make a histogram or a PDF of the scattering angle, I end up with something that looks like this. I get a peak in the center, peak to the right, and peak to the left. It's kind of cool. 
Well, we wanted to explore this more, uh, but when we first saw this, I just found it very funny because, of course, I took plenty of quantum mechanics growing up as a physicist and would read quotes like from our uh, uh, luminaries in the you know the 20, early 20th century that both matter and radiation possess a remarkable duality of character as they sometimes exhibit the properties of waves and other times those of particles. Now, it's obvious that a thing cannot be a form of wave motion composed of particles at the same time. The two concepts are too different said Heisenberg in 1930. <clears throat> well, Heisenberg had never studied robots, okay? Like I said, to, to, to learn a little bit more, we wanted to do a computer simulation. Doing a computer simulation of, of these kind of systems is not trivial. Um, and the not trivial part is that, in fact, there's plenty of multi, so-called multi-body simulators out there, but getting the interaction environment, the pterodynamic interactions uh, correct is not trivial. Jennifer. Bostock at the time worked quite a bit with the originators of this uh, package, uh, in particular Armand Pozaki was a student at the time, to basically measure the so-called drag anisotropy function of Lego wheels on ground, which I won't go into, but you can ask me later, um, and developed a simulation which matched pretty well the trajectory of, let's say, uh, the head of the robot as a function of time in experiment simulation. Such that, in fact, <clears throat> the distributions of, of scattering that we measured in experiment for different spacings, here's a narrow spacing uh, of the posts, and here's a wider spacing of the posts, uh, reproduce pretty well in simulation. Okay, so you, with the simulation and experiment, you can, like I said, uh, vary parameters, and you can quantify some of this. And here's how we quantified it. Well, we measured the, as a function of D, the separation between the posts, the kind of width of the distribution of that scattering. And for small d up here, you see a pretty wide distribution, and that scattering is peaked pretty far away, you know, almost 40 degrees, plus or minus off the, off the, the, off the uh, central axis. Um, for uh, for a, as d increases, that power gets shifted more towards the center, such that when I have basically d large enough so that the robot only ever samples one post, I essentially have a single peak. The cool thing is that <clears throat> you can plot that kind of, uh, in this case, the 15th or 85% quantile angle, which is some measure of the spread of the distribution, as a function of D, and an experiment is blue and simulation is gray, and you see it follows a nice kind of downward trend. And the funny thing is that if I plop on my Fraunhofer diffraction line, uh, theoretical prediction, which is what I showed you a couple slides back when I was showing you real wave diffraction, it doesn't do a terrible job of capturing some of this data, which we found was kind of cool. Uh, and it turns out that you can even sort of think of this as that, that we sort of have a, a new principle for undulatory robots, and it's kind of an uncertainty principle. If I had a robot going around on Mars and it had a bunch of narrow boulders that it was going through and it wasn't controlling for anything, the more narrow those boulders are, the more I expect it to scatter. So the better localized I have the, my robot's position when it's scattered, the less I know uh, its outward lateral momentum after collision. Okay. okay. Well, one can take the simulation and make the robot longer and skinnier and make really uh, fun simulations, and we're still exploring some of this. Here is a longer, skinnier robot, uh, and here's a long array of posts. <clears throat> for reasons I'll show you in a minute. And in this case, the robot went straight through, and this is this kind of representative of this kind of uh, uh, dynamics. This depends on initial conditions. Here now, the robot is going to scatter. Stop this one so you can see it. And it's going to scatter off into the left by kind of two bumps of its head. Oh, I hear a, I see a question. Ah, uh, if I may. Please. So, uh, probably you, you mentioned it at the beginning, but... Uh, uh, can you repeat what are the initial conditions? How do you vary them? Yeah, the variation of initial conditions is basically the distance from the array, and that's set. There's a periodicity of that in this direction, and the distance uh, left and right. There's a little box of initial conditions that generate all possible scattering patterns, and because of the periodicity of the system, it just repeats. So we're getting these different scatterings by varying the initial condition of the, the position of the robot, maintaining everything else the same, the wave parameters. I see. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Good question. Sorry I wasn't clear on that. Uh, 
Here, for example, is another initial condition, which again, you're, we're just making slight tweaks in where we start the robot. You know, here I can show you. Right here, you can see its head started here, and here it started back a little bit. And here, this is a fun one, <clears throat> where I basically will, the head will collide, and then it'll collide again, and that sort of and self interferes, it winds its way through the post. And I will tell you, you can even get sort of evanescent like waves where the robot will just trace its way all the way through these posts uh, forever and ever and ever, as long as you let the simulation run. Okay. Uh, well, again, this is, <laughs> there are no quantum mechanics here, but there is some interesting active physics going on. And it turns out that the secret, at least for the experiments that we ran, that Jennifer figured out, was that you can understand a lot of what's going on by the interaction of a robot with a single post, such that its head comes in and runs into the post uh, and then goes on its way. What's going on here? Well, it turns out that <clears throat> as the head goes in, remember, the key of this robot is that its motors are really strong and it's maintaining its, self it's, maintaining its so called self deformation pattern, that serpentoid curve. Uh, and so what happens is when that robot runs into the post, basically its head gets pinned. And, but its motor is really strong, so it's, re, it's changing its shape. But the only way for that force condition to be met, since it's pinned to the post at this stage by friction um, and normal forces, is for the robot to reorient. And so that's what happens. The wheels slip, the robot reorients, until the head achieves a tangency condition and then goes along its way. Okay? And it turns out that the amount it reorients, a single robot, is a linear function of how long it spends grinding its head into the post, how persistent that collision is. Now, it turns out that particular phases uh, where the robot starts and impact locations on the peg lead to longer duration collisions. And as the spacing decreases, trajectories that would have had low duration collisions become shifted to higher duration collisions. And that's because what happens is that there's plenty of trajectories that basically either graze or just miss the, and I've tried to illustrate that here, Basically, this one would have grazed or just missed the post, but there's now another post in the way, and it runs into it and gets reoriented. And that is the first order explanation of why we get this beautiful scattering pattern. And it has everything to do with this persistence of dynamics. So, so unlike the Landau and Lipschitz collisions that we know and love, these active collisions are a totally different beast. Not quantum mechanical, active mechanical. Okay, well, just for fun, that led us to think of a control strategy, again, along the lines of what we learned with our little legged robot, that if you know something about how you're going to scatter, in this case, how long you're going to spend grinding your head against the post, you can pre-correct your wave to go straight. And so fix the distribution. So here we used a, something called the amplitude modulation method, which is going to modulate the, the amplitude of the wave along the body of the robot to change its orientation. And we're going to do that by putting a little contact sensor on the head and measuring how long it spends in duration. So if it spends a long time, you have a larger amplitude modulation and a short time to turn. And here's what it looks like in so-called open loop when I don't have that uh, modulation scheme. You can see the robot go through and collide. This thing, by the way, flying over it is the gantry system, which is tracking the robot and following it and pick it up and put it down. And here now I do a closed loop where it now senses something about the environment. And pre-correct or correct, and then go straight on its way. And you can quantify this <clears throat> by looking at the distribution. Uh, and that distribution is, again, an open loop. You have your multiple peaks, and it's relatively broad. And when you turn on the controller, you sort of destroy the diffraction pattern. So you're making a measurement, in some sense, and destroying the diffraction pattern. OK, well, you might say, how robust is this collisional diffraction effect? We showed it robophysically. Let me just briefly show you something which, which is biological, but which led us into uh, a new kind of robot. Uh, here's a so-called uh, Mojave shovel nose snake. Um, its natural environment is desert sand with sparse heterogeneities in it. And it turns out this is sort of a robotic snake. It basically likes to play this snaky wave, this serpentoid curve down its body, uh, because we've discovered in another paper, another couple papers, that this is actually good for this animal to move fast across sand. You can, we have an eLife paper recently on this if you're interested. 
Okay. Well, it turns out that you can play a similar game, much harder experiment because it's a living system. If you have great undergraduates and led by parent, and you can put an array of posts and you can start a snake here and you can have undergraduates chase the snake uh, hundreds and hundreds of times through this array of posts and watch what happens. And here's just six trials, colored different. And these are posts are relatively stiff. And lo and behold, when you do that, you end up with experimentally a distribution which actually has about five peaks. So the snake goes through or scatters off to the left or scatters off to the right or scatters very strongly off to the left or very strongly off to the right. And the key feature here <clears throat> and the key hypothesis is that these snakes are moving really fast and they don't have good vision. So we think that that robotic wave that they're playing is basically they keep playing it and it's the, the mechanics, the active mechanics which lead to the this pattern. And so I just like this as because there's Schrodinger's in his piece, What is Life from the 40s, uh, which basically led to the molecular biology revolution. He also has another quote in there which says, new laws are to be expected in the organism. And here I might, you know, modestly say we have a new law that's first order desert snakes or wavicles. Okay. It turns out the cool thing in this is that we were able to put this diffraction phenomenon to good use in the sense that we made a model, and this is based on some biology, which says that snakes, unlike our robots, which are serially connected motors, are, are much more interesting in the sense that they have a spinal cord and muscle, which is their motor, on either side of that spinal cord, which activates, here's red and black, in bands that travel down the body. So motor muscle goes from active to inactive, back to active and inactive on the other side, act, inactive to active to inactive. And when it's active, it's shortening. And it turns out Perrin had a brilliant idea that said that at the point on a particular side of the snake where the, where the muscle is going from inactive to active, the snake more readily buckles at that point. And we can talk physiologically where that might be. And she made a little model which had that in it. And that's it. Play the wave and buckle at certain points on the body and lo and behold, when you do that, that is this black curve, and it reproduces pretty well what's going on. And so it gives us an idea of by scattering the snake, we've been able to sort of peer into what we call the so-called neuromechanical control strategy. In this case, the snake is using what we call passive mechanisms to traverse this environment. Um, and this has support in the fact that this is the idea is that <clears throat> the the snake has this, there's a little bit of anatomy, the snake has these muscles which connect the tendons, which connect to the vertebrae. Uh, and, and unlike those uh, robots that I showed you earlier, this thing is essentially um, actuated on both sides. But the idea is that it has active elements and passive bending uh, just naturally built in. Um, okay, well, this gave us an idea to make a new robot a new kind of limbless robot. Um, we didn't think of it as a robot. We thought of it as a robo-physical model. And, and this was actually done by an undergraduate at Georgia Tech, a Marine, and under parent supervision. And the idea here is that you now have a robot which has a spinal cord, which is completely passive and flexible. Again, the Lego wheels. But on either side are arrayed motors. And those motors are going to bend these segments by cables connected by Kevlar thread. Uh, it's easier when I show you a video of it. Um, so what one of the students here is doing is that these motors are on, so that Kevlar thread is resisting being bent, and these motors are off, so this is meaning they've been spun out. The, the cogs have been sort of spun out, and so it's easy to resist in one way and hard in the other, the ingredient that Perrin positive we need. And when you do that, you can put it on hard ground and you can play this serpentoid curve from the, from the angles of the robot and you see it crawls pretty nicely. In fact, you could take data on this and I won't bore you with all the data, but it turns out that there's an optimal amplitude of, 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 of undulation of the motors, which you get best transport uh, over the ground. The cooler thing though, is that in contrast so all other robots, limbless robots, which have been made, which are these serially connected uh, robots, including ours, which I just showed you, 
ours has this kind of interesting uh, model, more biologically modeled uh, morphology. And it turns out that gets you a nice advantage. And the advantage is, going back to lattices, that we had previously worked with a colleague at Carnegie Mellon to study how to make his limbless robot uh, move through lattices. And what he ended up doing was creating a pretty complicated control scheme where the robot is basically playing a wave, but sensing uh, if that wave, if the, the torques on the motors are large, and basically trying to always adjust its shape, adjust its amplitude, uh, and so-called compliantly control its, uh, its, its uh, shape. And it turns out that that's complicated because whether you use different, amp different, different windows of control that the robot uh, puts along its body uh, determines its performance, its time to traverse. In contrast, Marine's robot, there's no control going on here. It's simply these active, uh, active mechanics of the motors moving and the passive elements of the robot's body, and you put it through a lattice, and emergently, the thing just transports itself. This is one of our earliest videos. It looks better now, but again, we don't really care how well it does. We're interested in, in more of the principles. And the cool thing is that, in fact, uh, you see interesting emergent behaviors. You see passive buckling, which we expected, and something we didn't expect, little reversals resulting from the bilateral actuation and directional compliance. Let me see if I can find one here, where the robot actually spontaneously, oops, spontaneously backs up and seems to find itself uh, moving in a new trajectory. And you can see that if you plot kind of the histogram or PDF of the speed of the robot, uh, it's basically the speed of the center of geometry. Often it's going you know, two district, you have two tails here, a long tail, which extends out to, I don't know, eight centimeters a second, and a shorter tail, which extends to minus four centimeters a second. And this one beats this one, so you move forward. But the cool thing is that you have these negative velocities at all. So the robot is emergently backing up to be able to navigate that lattice. Now, this is, and I'm basically done, this is essentially, uh, starting to teach us things about how real snakes uh, move around in complex lattices. And I will just say as a little plug that we're actually going to a presumably simpler system, although still very complicated, that of nematode worms. Uh, why? Because in nematode worms, there is an enormous amount of, remember early on I said how hard it is to study living systems at this scale because we just have a hard time peering into the into the muscle and nervous system. Uh, but there are plenty of tools which have been worked out in nematode worms, um, and we can start to not only, um, in collaboration with a, a nematode expert at Georgia Tech, Hong Lu, we could start to not only uh, peer in to the uh, nervous system and to the musculoskeletal muscle, muscle system, muscular system, um, but we can even use mutants to, to engineer different types of nematodes with, with potentially uh, damaged muscle or, or poor sensing to kind of get at principles for the living system. Okay, um, and I should also note that kind of amusingly, we see spontaneous reversals in, in nematodes too, although we're not sure, we're pretty confident these are not uh, necessarily related to the reversals we see in the robot. Okay, so that's my talk today. Um, Robophysics, a systematic study of self-propelling systems and complex environments. We can now build these readily and use them as scientific instruments to learn new active matter physics as well as function as models of living systems. And the example today, in an effort to discover principles of locomotion complex terrain, found a useful analogy to wave and particle duality. And I just want to close on one little bit um, that it turns out that that this is not restricted to only uh, robots moving in, in heterogeneous, uh, weird desert environments. We've been having fun, and this I wanted to put in here, with a, and I'll skip this, uh, with, with uh, a situation where robots, um, which happens biologically and astrophysically, where the, the active agent, uh, the, the moving agent, interacts with other agents via environment alone. And what do I mean by that? Well, we built a little robot. Oops. Is that not playing? Hang on. We built a little robot. 
and it has wheels and it has a little differential mechanism which allows it to turn spontaneously. And this is Yasmin, who was a postdoc, who's steering the robot around the deformations of this spandex sheet alone. And it gets cooler because if you put then a more controlled experiment where you put a central uh, depression in here, you can let the robot uh, uh, run around on the membrane and spontaneously it finds orbits. Some are circular, but more typically they're processing orbits. And it turns out that in collaboration with Pablo Laguna, who is a, a, a general relativist, who was at Georgia Tech and now at UT Austin, uh, it turns out that this active system actually uh, makes the, the, what you've probably seen as the marble on the rubber sheet analogy of GR, which is a bad analogy, but gee, there's plenty of literature written on that. This active nature actually turns it into a good analogy such that Pablo has been able to show that we can map the robot and its little depression field as a test particle in, on geodesics in a new fiducial space-time, which is kind of cool. Uh, and that's all I want to say on there. We've also been spending a lot of time on collectives uh, of robots uh, inspired by some of our biological studies. And I'll just put in a plug for some of these. We've studied collective excavation collectives of, of, of crawling robots, collectives of little robots, which we call Bob bots, uh, in honor of Bob Berenger, who passed away shortly before I was thinking about these things. Um, and these are robots which have no brains at all that can spontaneously, via phase change, uh, begin to transport objects in their environment, uh, as well as more complicated, seemingly more complicated uh, robots we call smarticles, none of which can move on its own, but collectively when enclosed uh, in a ring in this case um, and subject to very simple control such that each robot stops moving in response to light can emergently photo tax. So I think that's all I want to say uh, and I'll call it there. It's about two o'clock and I'll take any, oh wait, no, no, I have to say one more thing. Uh, that if you want more RoboPhysics, you can read some of our reviews. Or uh, last year, virtually, we had ran our sixth annual RoboPhysics focus session. And we had 55 talks in five sessions, including terrific talks from students and about speakers. And we're running it again this year. It'll be, uh, it'll be round seven. My former student and now faculty member Johns Hopkins, Chen Li, is the boss. And you're welcome to submit an abstract or attend our focus session at the March meeting 2022, which should be in person. So now I really will close uh, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniel, for your wonderful talk. And we are open now for questions. Please uh, don't be shy and ask questions if you have. Por favor. Gracias para todos. Uh, can I make a question? Please. Uh, well, I, I don't, it, uh, first of all, it was a very wonderful presentation. It's very interesting. And I, I have, uh, it's um, kind of like out of curiosity, have you wondered or asked yourselves about uh, medical applications, for example, for your robot that replicates the snake, but thinking in like nano robots that could go inside the body with this type of dynamics? Yeah, I haven't done anything with medical devices, but certainly my colleague uh, Chosit, and collab former collaborator Chosit at Carnegie Mellon, um, has tried to use some of the principles of, of luminous robots for endoscopy type applications. I imagine that one of the things I will say is that you know there are plenty of people who talk sort of science fiction, like about sending robots into the bloodstream and wiggling around and moving through, and it, when you see those things, they tend to be actually, uh, in, in any potential demonstrations, they tend to be controlled externally via magnetic fields. I think one of the things that, that our work is doing is by studying the basic principles of self-propulsion um, at these uh, ma more macroscopic scales, we can get uh, insight into how these things might one day be deployed in, in more microscopic situations. We've actually, after having a nice collaboration with a, with a biophysicist, Kirsty Wan, in the UK, 
uh, who's interested in, in modeling of algae cell swimming, we've been making a kind of macro scale, but low Reynolds number appropriate uh, version of, of her algae to study how swimming at low Reynolds number can occur. A great question. I will say that there's other applications for these robots, which, uh, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm not an engineer, but I'm starting to realize that there's potential commercialization uh, opportunities for such things. Yeah, especially for transportation, right? With uh, autonomous vehicles, it sounds like it is. Well, well, certainly autonomous vehicles, you know, the thing about autonomous vehicles, right, is that we pretty much understand how to drive cars on flat roads, right? That you, and, and in fact, but but uh, driving, moving in more complex environments is actually uh, you know when and when you have to use not just kind of like a rocket ship expelling stuff out at your uh, at your backside or you know a car with with wheels that basically don't slip, but when you have to self propel via self deformation. And here I just want to put in a little plug because this is some of I think the most nice for me, satisfying stuff we've done uh, in the sense that we've spent a lot of time studying animals on granule materials, which is an example of a potentially complex landscape, including sand swimming lizards, uh, and built these robo-physical models, which all have the feature that, unlike most of our human technology, which transports, they change their shape as a function of time. And it just so turns out that we've discovered a principle is maximize your geometric phase. So geometric phase turns out to show up in locomotion, and this was first noted by Wilczek and Shapir in their paper in the 80s, and then developed by control theorists um, in which you basically, if you, in homogeneous environments, want to maximize your forward transport, say if you're a little so-called three-link per cell swimmer, you enclose the most geometric phase in a path through some configuration space, in this case defined by two angles. And it turns out we, sh we made the first demonstration of that in a PRL about eight years ago, in moving in uh, sand. And now we're just finding that this idea of maximizing geometric phase to some approximation um, allows you to sort of figure out optimal self-deformation, shape-changing patterns in very diverse locomotors, including swimmers, but also including uh, little legged walkers and crawlers. With the key insight here, and it turns out that where these folks thought this, this self-propulsion at low Reynolds number was important, it turns out that many macroscopic locomotors, like the snakes I've been showing you, like the lizards uh, that are swimming in sand, are so dominated by frictional dissipation that this is this idea of this analogy to movement at low Reynolds number is a good one, where inertia is basically not so that was a way for me to sneak in stuff which I didn't have a chance to sneak in. But really, then I think points to nice principles. And another nice intersection of physics and robotics is here that this gauge theory turns out to have an important role in locomotion, which was recognized, like I said, 40 years ago, 34 years ago, but not followed up experimentally. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Adam. Any other questions? I'm off. I see someone too. Yeah, I've got a question. Go, Go ahead, Daniel. Anyone else? Uh, ask Please. Me? Okay. So, uh, first of all, thanks for the talk. I didn't know this uh, new field was coming up in physics, and it's interesting for sure. Uh, um, my question is regarding the. Um, Initial position of the snake. Yeah. So in your analogy, you're you're um, saying that it, you can have uh, see some sort of dispersion um, occurring, and so in that analogy, um, do you uh, keep the wavelength of the snake the same? Uh, yes. Before yes. every experiment, or do you yes. vary it? Yep. The wavelength is the same. Now it turns out, and you can read our paper on this, that if you vary the wavelength that changes the amount of scattering. So if you're asking what sort of H bar here in this business, it turns out that wavelength, really the wavelength and amplitude of the undulation are coupled necessarily. And, but by varying that, you by increasing the, decreasing the wavelength, increasing the amplitude, you get stronger scattering. 
sort of like analogous to you know increasing the energy of a photon you get uh, stronger uh, potentially stronger scattering so yes one can but again we have only very very few parameters on this system and it's really in need of of some exploration um oh that's right so uh so like a follow-up if i may yeah um uh, you had a slide where you showed uh, the head of a snake colliding with the rod. Yeah. Uh, with one cylinder. And so the question was, if you try to map out uh, the angle, I don't know, the uh, head of the snake makes with the radius of the rod where mm. it touches it. And you can uh -oh. bring angle, maybe? Could that be done? or I, um, missed, I missed that. Do you... Uh, I missed the, the you cut out there for a second. Oh, yeah, my, my internet sucks a bit. So uh, I was asking if you uh, tried um, kind of mapping the. Yeah. Um, yes, the answer the is sort angle of yes. the head of a snake makes with the rod, yes. sort of with the radius. The answer is sort of oh, yes. Oh, and, and what do you find? I'll refer you to the paper for that. Uh, we haven't done it uh, in terribly okay, yeah. large amount, but indeed that's an important parameter. And we did a little bit of that in the paper. But we only have one paper on the. On it. It's a long FizzRev E paper, um, but and so it has plenty of details. But I suggest you take a look and then follow up with me if you're interested. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting. Okay. Right. Any Thanks. other question? No it seems there is no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And I have to get to another meeting anyway. Uh, yeah. But thank, thank you so, you much, all so much for your talk, Danny. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for. Yes, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. My pleasure. Thank you for, for having me, and I hope to visit you one day in person. Yes. Looking forward to that. All right. All right. Nice to see you all. Send me emails if you like. Thank you, Daniel. Yep. All right. Nice. Thanks. Bye-bye.